Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by former businessman, former police officer turned author, Alfred Anderson. Alfred started out as a businessman, then he became a police officer, and he is now an author. And what he's here to talk about today is how the public doesn't know their rights, their constitutional rights, and exactly how they need to be interacting with police officers. So he's going to give us some education on that from the experience of a police officer. So, Alfred, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure being here with you, and uh, it's always fun to kind of explain from a deputy sheriff's point of view the abysmal lack of understanding of the populace of their constitutional rights. So that's what I really try to explain in my book, Deputy Know Your Rights. Well, before we jump into that, let's go ahead and kind of give the listeners a little background on yourself. Well, basically, I became, uh, after years of being in business, I owned a number of businesses, sold them, and basically retired when I was about 40. And uh, I decided after, you know, maybe about a six-month sabbatical, I decided, hey, I can't just do nothing. So I always wanted to kind of explore either law or law enforcement. And uh, I decided in the end to, uh, after being, after I have gone, to the University of University of Colorado and a col- and a university in England. After five years, I decided that eh, I don't think I want to go through three more years of education to be a lawyer. So I decided to go to the College of Southern Idaho in uh, Twin Falls, Idaho, and study for a year to be a law enforcement officer. And after that, I was hired on with a rural western idaho department to be a deputy sheriff and to say the least it was probably the best career of my life because it was so enlightening and so instructive to me uh to exercise power but in a way that was good for the people and i live by the adage that humility is the power that makes is the catalyst that makes power benevolent. In other words, if you're not humble and understanding where the power come from comes from, you basically tend to abuse the power. And that's we're seeing so often now in common police stories that are abusing the citizens, and that's just it's horrible. So I speak of that is in my experiences through anecdotal stories in the book but also to explain to the public how little they know of their constitutional rights, especially the Fourth, Fifth, and Second Amendments, and how they should interact with the police. And it's important because uh, the police abuse the citizens of their rights. Well, explain to people who who might not know what those three amendments are. Or, okay. or, you know, you talked about the fourth, the fifth, and the second. You, you know, go through each one of them and explain to the uh, listeners what they are who, who might not know. Absolutely. The Fourth Amendment is probably uh, the second or third most important amendment of the first ten. Uh, the Fourth Amendment basically explains your right against unreasonable search and seizure of your person, place, houses, and effects without warrant by the government to take or search what you have. Now, that's in a very much of a synopsis form, but basically it says a police officer or any law enforcement officer must have probable cause to search or seize 
those things, your person, place, houses, and effects, so on and so forth. So in others, for instance, if I make a traffic stop, I have to have probable cause to make that stop. In other words, a violation has occurred, whether it be speed, which is common, uh, a traf- uh, a tail light that doesn't function, but I must have a violation of either traffic code or criminal code to stop that vehicle. I just simply can't, as a law enforcement officer, stop you without probable cause. Now, what is probable cause? Probable cause means that a crime has been committed or is about to be committed. In the case of traffic code, it just means a violation of the traffic code, but it you have to substantiate that when you make that stop. I simply can't stop a vehicle because I want to. The color of the car, the color of the skin, the whatever it might be, I can't just stop you because I feel like it. No, I have to have probable cause. And that's important because it's a protection of the person or the citizen against unreasonable search and seizure. And that's what the Fourth Amendment is. Now, let's go to the Fifth. So as soon as I stop you, you have a right to main, remain silent. That's the common Miranda uh, recitation. Okay, basically says you have a right to main, remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. So on and so forth. Okay, it means shut up. Don't say anything. In other words, if I come up to your car and I ask and I say, do you know how fast you were going? Or have you had anything to drink? Or is there anything in your car that is suspicious or I should know about? You just simply say, officer, I prefer not to answer your questions. And that's your right. All you have to do, for instance, in a traffic stop, is to provide your license, your registration, and your proof of insurance. That's state law. On most states, I, I I don't think there's a variance in any other states on that matter. So driving is not a right; it's a privilege granted by the state. So when you take and you obtain a driver's license, you ha- you basically say that when you're stopped, you will produce those items. But beyond that, you don't have to answer any questions, and people simply don't know that. In other words, if I asked you if you had anything to drink. You just say, hey, I don't answer those questions. Because as soon as you say I've had one drink or I have gone one mile over the speed limit, you have admitted to at least a violation of the traffic code or a possibility of DUI. And I can continue with my investigation. So in other words, people just don't know to keep their mouths shut. Just simply say, so officer, I, I'm not going to answer those questions. And there are many examples in YouTube of people that videotape officer encounters, and they basically say those things. And then they're good educational videos because they basically stand their rights and say, I'm not going to answer your questions, period. Produce your ID. Why? What crime have I committed? Well, I want to see your ID. No, you don't have to produce that ID only when you're stopped on a traffic stop. But if you're stopped on a sidewalk, for instance, and an officer suspects you of something, but without reasonable, articulable suspicion that a crime has been committed or about to be committed, you don't have to say anything or produce anything. It's your right. So that's the Fourth and Fifth Amendment in a nutshell. The Fifth Amendment produced the Miranda citation you have the right to remain silent because miranda versus arizona um i forget his first name now as i think about it i knew it it's in my book but it's uh he just didn't know his rights and so he was he was let off because the officer or the officers failed to inform him that he had the right to shut up and that's the problem with most interactions with police officers and we as a police officer we will push it we definitely will push it i pushed it and i will uh, as long as they uh, the the citizen permits me to ask them questions and will answer you know what i'm going to push it because it's my job to find out all right what's going on but as soon in my case as someone said something and it never happened with me only one case 
where I ran up against an attorney, did I have a problem? So you 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 say that you don't have to produce your ID unless you're on a traffic stop, but if you don't produce the ID, then uh, what, what what can the officer do? Because they get pretty upset when you you won't show them your ID, even if you are right. Well, basically, you know what a lot of times happens is if you resist them and you say, "I'm not going to give you my ID because I what crime has been committed?" You simply ask them, "What crime has been committed?" What probable cause do you have? Well, I don't need one. I just want to see your ID. Well, there's only one instance that you have to do that, and it's called the Terry stop, and it was proved by the Supreme Court. And it basically encompasses a situation where uh, it's a dangerous situation for the officer. It's in a dark alley or something where crime is being committed or so on and so forth. At that point, he has a right to ask for that ID, but... 90% of the time in a normal encounter on the street or wherever, you don't have to, you don't have to produce your ID unless a crime and he, a crime has been committed or he says, Hey, I, I want to see your ID because of this reason that I think you have done something wrong. And so it's better off, you're better off producing ID, but in most cases, no, you don't have to, it's your right. You're a citizen, and you have civil rights. Now, let me give you a good example of what happened to officers. And from my standpoint, many officers should be tried as the officers were tried in the Los Angeles case against Rodney King. There are four officers that went to court in the state level, and they were found not guilty. However, the, the federal court charged them with violation of civil rights against Rodney King, and two of them were found guilty and put in federal prisons. And this is this is good in my standpoint because too many officers are abusing the rights of the citizens. They're not respecting the civil rights that citizens have. And that's tragic. But it's born out of ignorance, ignorance on the general populace's uh, knowledge. They're just not educated on what their civil rights really are. No course in the in the country, as far as I'm concerned, high school, college teaches what is so basic and what every every citizen should know: the origin of the Constitution, why it was why it was formed in such a manner, and the rights. The first ten amendments are so important. And when Benjamin Franklin left the Conventional Congress in 1778, a woman stopped him on the street and asked him, what form of government have you given us, sir? And he replied, ma'am, a republic, if you can keep it. Absolutely. So tell us what we can do or or, or how can people go to learn their rights and, and, you know, be up on the rights that, that you talk about so they will know them? Well, I wrote a book, and I, I I guess I'm obviously promoting what I wrote, but it's called Deputy Know Your Rights, and it's from a perspective of a former deputy sheriff. And they relay anecdotal stories and history of how these amendments were formed and the reason for them. And, and it explains in a very common uh, language what people should know, how they should interact with police. Now, for instance, does that mean you become, uh, you know, uh, angry with the police? No. Treat them with respect. Be kind. Answer their questions if they're general questions. Where are you going today? How is it going for you today? But as soon as they begin to ask investigatorial questions such as, that could possibly incriminate you, just simply say, I don't answer those questions, period. Now, let me give you a perfect example of how ignorant the population is on one amendment especially, and that's the Second Amendment. It's the one amendment that protects the whole document. And the Second Amendment says the right to bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, what does that mean? You don't touch it. Period. Infringe is the is the Latin word that says don't touch. You don't you don't even go there. Period. Now, 
Why was that? Why was that formed? Why was that put in the Constitution or the first ten amendments? It was not for self protection. It was not for hunting, as you commonly hear in the press. It was about maintaining the power in the hands of the people against a tyrannical government. Period. No other reason. And I have numerous quotations from the founding fathers in my book that basically state that fact from the Federalist Papers. George Washington, Thomas Edison, Benjamin Franklin, on and on it goes. They all stated that if the people lose that power, they'll be tittering. And there's a common saying that says, when the government fears the people, there is liberty. When the people fear the government, there is tyranny. And that's why there's such an attempt by huh, every state, con every Congress in each state, California, New York especially, no matter what the Supreme Court or the appellate courts knock down these illegal uh, laws that infringe the Second Amendment, they continue to try and take the, the arms from the people. And it's tragic because they know, as what happened in Germany, what happened in Russia, what happened in China, what happened in so many countries, when they took the arms, they slaughtered the people. And the government, under tyranny, has that control. And that's the tragedy and why the Founding Fathers put that Second Amendment in there. It protects everything else. So when the people have the power to thwart tyrannical government, then it stops that kind of illegal action that we so commonly see. And we're seeing great infringements right now of the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Uh, Owen Troyer from InfoWars was put in jail under this January 6th because he spoke out truthfully, and they put him in jail for freedom for his speech. Where are we? Are we in Russia? Are we in Nazi Germany? And that's what's happening. So many people are being imprisoned for what they say. And this is wrong. And it's tragic, but it's the, the, the calamity that is happening in our country today. And the people still have the power via the arms. But whether they have the will or not to exercise their constitutional rights, that's another question. And it, it takes education. It takes vigilance on the part of the populace. And that's what Benjamin Franklin said, if you can keep it. It takes vigilance on the, on the part of the citizenry to exercise their rights. Most definitely. And Owen Troyer is now home. Yes. So tell us about your other book as well. Well, that was, uh, that came, I wrote both books this year. And uh, the second book happened to be an inspiration or a, a spurring by my brother and asked me if I had another book in me. And I, uh, I said, no, no, no. He says, well, how about a novel? And I said, absolutely not. I, it just wasn't there. Because it took me four years to write the first book from my experiences as a deputy. And it kind of goes through becoming a deputy, being a deputy, and anecdotal stories. Well, this one, almost within a week of him asking, was almost like an epiphany, and it just came to me, the whole story. And it's, it's called Sasha, My Guardian Sasquatch, and it involves, you know, Sasquatches are, you know, mythical, legendary creature that exists in the northern, all over the world, really. Bigfoot, Yeti. Other countries have uh, different names for them, but they they are all over the world. And uh, I just was intrigued by the whole concept of Sasquatch because where I live in the northeast part of Washington, it's very common. It's a very kind of a, a, a festival of this creature. People celebrate Sasquatch so on and so forth. And I thought of the story where a young deputy sheriff – after four years of being a deputy, he was elected, and he encounters this young female Sasquatch up in the mountains looking for an illegal uh, marijuana grow after he just was elected, and he finds that this Sasquatch is entrapped, and he releases it. 
and there's a bond created. Of course, that's the first chapter, and it basically explains, kind of gets the, the reader involved in the in the whole story. But the sheriff is battling against an Ill, uh, a Mexican cartel bringing in illegals and drugs from Canada, and it's going on. This is this is truthful, um, and he's battling against this cartel. It's also a love story between himself and Angelina. And uh, it involves the battle between, you know, their love story and their threats uh, by the cartel. And it ends dramatically with, uh, you know, with them going after the cartel, the department and the whole state of Washington trying to control this cartel. And in the end, Sasha saves him. It's a, it's a good love story. It's a good story of intrigue, of criminal activity. And I think the public, you know, and all both of my books are available on Amazon and worldwide. But uh, it's it's an interesting story because it, it, it brings in truthful events that are happening on the northern side. Everybody focuses on the southern border. Yeah, it's happening. It's tragic. But it's also coming in from the north. And people don't realize it. But, you know, when you live in the northern states, especially where I do in northeast Washington, you know that these things are happening. And uh, so I wrote a story about that. And uh, I think the the reader would find it a very interesting read and fun read. So tell us about any other upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about. Nothing. I don't want to write any more books. <laughs> It was, uh, believe it or not, I've thought about it, and I don't necessarily, because I think the story of Sasha is a very good story. Uh, I've been told it could be made into a movie. Ah, we'll see. <laughs> but it's the type of story that you don't want to continue. It just it's, it gets destroyed like so many sequels of movies and so on and so forth. So it would have to be something different. And for some reason, um, I'm amazed that uh, that I even got that far writing books because I never thought I had it in me. And it's, it's been fun. Uh, the second book took me only a month and a half to, to write because the story, as I say, was almost like an epiphany. It was there. I wrote the first chapter and then the last three chapters right away, and then I filled in the rest you know, over the next month, but I would sit for eight hours and literally write because it was, there was no hesitation. There was no consideration of, okay, where do I go with the story? It was there. Uh, I'm shocked myself from where it came from, you know, it was as if God himself put a a story in my head and says, hey, write this. I said, okay. But, you know, it's, um, I guess when you get the, the blood, the, 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 the flavor of blood in your mouth as far as so to speak it's kind of fun it just was enjoyable writing both books after i got into it but they're they're valuable stories that say something to the general public especially deputy because it in my mind the whole nation should read it should be a book for every teenager to read in high school because it's interesting it's anecdotal but it's also extremely edu- educative and how to interact with the police. And when people know how to interact with the police, they're going to save themselves from a lot of troubles. Don't admit to anything. Don't say anything when they start asking you, do you have anything in your car? Have you had anything to drink tonight? You don't answer those questions. Don't say, oh, I had just one beer. No, I don't even go that far. Just say, I don't answer those questions. And they might say, well, what do you got afraid of? Hey, you simply reply, it's my Fifth Amendment right not to answer you. And generally speaking, most police officers are good people. I have to say, they don't want to do anything that's wrong, that hurts the citizen. Because the way I looked at it, and I started, became a deputy when I was 40 years old. I was quite old when I got into the profession, and it was, oh, so instructive. But like I wrote in the book, I had some of the shit kicked out of me. I was humbled by that time. 
when a person lives that many years and, you know, makes their mistakes, we realize that, you know, there by, by the grace of God go I, whether it be a DUI, and I was very adept at arresting DUI um, persons that were driving. That was my forte when I was a deputy. But I never criticized or judged the people. I would always tell them, and they would be crying sometimes. I said, look, we've got a problem here. Let's go get it fixed down at the county seat and get this thing, you know, over with. Now, what was my psychology in that? I said, we, let's. I didn't isolate them. I, I included myself. I became almost their advocate. And I never had to fight anybody when I arrested them because I would approach it humbly, but with respect. They were not guilty until they were proven guilty in a court of law. And so I treated them with respect and I said, let's get this fixed. And literally, they would go from someone ready to fight. And I arrested people out of San Quentin, felons. And they were literally, when I said it that way, they would lower their hands, put their hands behind their back, and let me cuff them. And it was just simple, a matter of respect, kindness to that individual, that citizen. It's my job. I'm a servant. I'm not a lord. I'm a servant as a deputy. And that's the tragedy of a lot of police officers today is they just are arrogant, condescending, and, and ignorant in many ways because they push to a point where they arrest people and then they're found that they were incorrect, false arrest, and they were sued. And you can see it on YouTube all over the place. And I listen to a lot of the reports and, you know, cities and counties are losing, losing thousands of Sometimes cases millions of dollars because of poor actions, ignorant actions on the police on the part of the police. And that's sad. Now, whether it be, and I would never want to work in the inner cities. Oh, it would just, that's a war zone. Where I worked in the rural part of Idaho was enough. I would not want to work in those inner cities because the hatred, the distrust, the, the animosity toward authority figures is just paramount. And I don't blame those people because they've been abused. And it's sad, whether it be Latino, black, Chinese, whatever. It's just, it's, it just, the inner cities are, are just absolute catastrophes already. Oh, what a, uh, now I'm speaking Spanish. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, tell us about, uh, any websites, or con contact info that you have so people can keep up with what you're up to well basically i have a facebook page but it's under my name alfred anderson i don't put a lot of personal information on it but i do you know i've had, i've got the books on there and uh i haven't done an actual i thought about doing a podcast myself on youtube but it's just i don't have the time i don't have the the expertise in doing it well but uh, I would advise people if they want to learn and read good books, you know, interesting books. Uh, it's all available on Amazon under my name, Alfred Anderson, under those titles, uh, two books. You can get them in hardcover, softcover, ebook, and now audiobook on their deputy. And uh, there, I can only say to the general listener that they're very important to read. At least the first book on deputy and knowing what you were never taught as a as a as a citizen. Never in the educational system did you hear what I present. And it's simple. I put it in anecdotal stories, but also the origins through many, many references, so on and so forth. And it's just uh it's that's about the only site. I don't have an actual website where people can go to and monitor what I have to say. I'm not that verbose. <laughs> uh, no problem. Ladies and gentlemen, please check out Alfred's books. Like he said, especially the first one, follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible as knowing our rights is very important and we all need to know them and be educated on them. 
If you have any guests or suggestion topics, see Jackson102 at Cox.net is the place to send them. As always, thank you for listening. And Alfred, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise. Well, it was definitely a pleasure. And that's my goal is to try and help educate the general public. So I would invite them, please. They're not expensive books. Even an ebook is $5. So, but you will, you'll find it very educational. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.